Good morning. This past Thursday was Ascension Day, and I'm sure that for many people the day just slipped by without them even thinking about it or thinking of the significance of Ascension Day. Has anyone ever asked you, or have you even asked yourself, what does Ascension Day even mean? What does it mean to our faith? Well, I want to start with looking at that. Firstly, it means that Jesus has finished his work on earth. Forty days after Easter, Jesus led his disciples out to the Mount of Olives. For the 40 days from Easter to Ascension, he'd been giving his disciples their last bits of instruction. He helped them put all the pieces together, which couldn't happen until they'd experienced his resurrection. And then he blessed them and ascended into the heavens until a cloud hid him from their eyes. Instead of being sad, Luke tells us in his gospel that the disciples were filled with joy. So what does that mean? Perhaps it's obvious, but sometimes the obvious needs to be stated. God sent his son into the world on a mission. He sent him here to save the world from sin. He sent Jesus here to rescue us for heaven. The fact that Jesus ascended back into heaven to be with his father at his right hand means that he accomplished his mission. And so what does that mean for you and for me? Well, this should give us the greatest joy and comfort. It answers the question which many have, that which the rich young ruler had for Jesus. Teacher, what good thing must I do? to get eternal life. We want desperately to be sure of eternal life, of heaven. Isn't there something we can do just to be 120% sure? And the answer is no. We just need to believe that Jesus has done it all. If there had been something left undone, if there was something that had to happen to complete God's plan to save us, Jesus wouldn't have ascended into heaven. He couldn't have left his disciples looking up into the sky if there was something that they had to do to be able to get to heaven with him. Everything was done. Every sin was paid for. So no wonder Jesus' ascension gave them such joy and why it gives us joy today still. Jesus has done it all. It also means that we have a friend in high places. We all know the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, we know the most important person. In the Apostles' Creed, we confess that Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This means we have a friend in the right place, in the best place. In 1 John 2, John writes, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So try to picture in your mind's eye how Jesus is pleading our case before God. Each time we confess our sins, many of them probably sins we've confessed time after time, there is Jesus at God's right hand, pleading our case, asking for mercy on our behalf because of what he has already accomplished for us. Have you got that picture? And because Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God, we have someone who speaks to the Father in our defense. God has given Jesus the right to pardon us before his throne, no matter how awful our sin may be, no matter how little we deserve to be pardoned. We can trust in Jesus to save each one of us, and we will be pardoned before God's throne. It also means that Jesus will come again. Luke's Gospel concludes with an account of the ascension which says this, And this is Jesus speaking. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out into the city of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then in our Acts reading, verse 11, we have these words. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so there's a connection there which we need to take note of. We see why Jesus' ascension into heaven gives us comfort, because he will return again. Luke tells us that he ascended. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And the angel said that Jesus will return in the same way that we saw him leave. When he comes again on the last day in power and in glory as the King of Kings, the whole world will tremble before him. But for those who believe in Jesus, his death, resurrection and ascension, there won't be any fear when he comes again. 
we will be filled with a joy like we've never experienced, as the disciples were filled with joy when Jesus ascended. And so we also need to ask, what are we supposed to do now while we wait? We see how the angels in Acts 1 asked the disciples, why are you staring up at the sky? Why are you standing around, looking, waiting? What are, what are you doing? I love that question from them. Well, Jesus tells us exactly what we're supposed to be doing while we wait for him to come back. And we see this in the passage known as the Great Commission from Matthew 28. And there are three things there that we need to be focused on. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Those are Jesus' words. And the context for the Great Commission is important because Jesus has been crucified, he's risen from the dead, the Jews had killed him, were ready to go do away with his disciples, the Roman Empire was a strict ruler, did not like people causing problems, and there was this great tension between the Jewish community and the Romans. And it was into this world of tension and upheaval that Jesus commissioned his disciples. Their commission was just as difficult then as it is for us today. But we've been given a mandate from Jesus, a command. This is what we're supposed to be doing while we wait for him to return. And we know that we've been given authority to carry out our task. We've been given power to witness to Jesus. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. As Christians, we know that we're here for a purpose greater than just having our job and paying the bills and bringing up our families. As great as those things are, there's a bigger purpose as well. In the short time God has given us here on earth, we can make an impact that will last. Our primary task is to make disciples. Everything else is secondary. We easily get caught up in doing the other things though, focusing our attention on church politics and buildings and all the other things that go along with running the organization that is called church. And these things are important, but only if they contribute to this ultimate objective, making disciples. That should be central to everything that we're doing. And it's also exciting that we don't have to confine ourselves to one area. We're told to make disciples everywhere. We have a worldwide focus. But we also need to be strategic about it. We start at home. We share the love of Jesus with those we live with, those we know, before we start going to everyone else. And they're two very different evangelistic approaches. There's, for example, Billy Graham as, an, as one way. He preached to thousands of people at a time. He converted thousands too. But this isn't what most of us are capable of or even equipped to do. But imagine one very typical Christian. We can call him Joe. He doesn't do anything significant in his church. He doesn't serve on parish council or any committees. He doesn't read the lesson or sing in the worship team. What he does do though, he makes friends. And he makes friends with unbelievers. He takes an interest in their lives. He demonstrates authenticity, integrity, moral courage, compassion, empathy. The love of Jesus overflows from his life and he's contagious. And because these unbelievers who have become his friends, are, they are open, they listen. Joe takes the opportunity to tell them about what Jesus has done and is continuing to do in his life. And when one of them trusts in Jesus, Joe spends time with them to show them how to pray, how to read their Bible, how to grow, how to know God better, how to tell others about what God has done for them as well. And Joe also encourages them to do the same thing, to make friends with other people, people who are not just people who know Jesus, but to unbelievers, to tell others about Jesus. And so more and more people are slowly added to this group. And slowly but surely, they would reach more and more people. This is something we can all do. Jesus gave us a strategy that is both simple and practical, making our Christian faith contagious in the lives of a few family and friends, investing our lives in a few people who in turn will invest their lives in others and in others and in others. Jesus tells us, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This task might seem quite scary, but we know that we're never alone. We're not doing this on our own. We can't do it on our own. Jesus leads and we follow. 
Jesus wants us to finish what he began. He came to the disciples, taught them, worked with them. He died on the cross, he rose from the dead. But before he ascended, he gave them and he gave us the commission to convert the world. He's not asking us to do the impossible. We can do it where we are, with those whom we meet. We can be a witness for Jesus. We can be contagious Christians. And so as we give thanks for all that the ascension means, let us not forget that through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have been given the power to witness to our Lord's love and saving grace. Let's not forget what we are supposed to be doing while we wait for Jesus to return. Amen.